Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery uh, for our regularly scheduled uh, Dhamma event. Uh, so, as usual, um, we will start with a period of meditation. And at the end of the meditation, I'll give a, a short Dhamma talk. And after the talk, I'll take any questions you might have related to the subject. And I have no idea what the subject is going to be yet. Well, we'll all find out in half an hour at the end of the meditation. So for now, go ahead and get in meditation posture. And so taking the time to carefully adjust your legs. Uh, especially if you sit in full lotus, it's extremely important to make sure that your posture is perfect. Um, but even if you're sitting in a, an easier posture, it's still, still good to really take the time uh, to arrange your, your body very carefully. Um, the number one cause of, of legs falling asleep is, is bad posture. So if you have an ongoing problem with your legs falling asleep during meditation, it's probably caused by your posture. So take the time, settle into your seat, paying close attention to the sensations in your tailbone, uh, in your upper thighs, uh, sensations in your ankles. Uh, usually it's, it's one of those three areas where there's pressure that eventually puts your legs or feet to sleep. So really paying close attention to make sure that the weight is distributed evenly and there's, there's no excessive, uncomfortable pressure anywhere. Sitting up straight with your hands resting in your lap. Take two or three long, slow, deep breaths. Letting the body and mind relax. Like with each inhalation, you're breathing in comfort, ease. With each exhalation, you're letting go of all your worries and concerns. Bring a little smile to your lips. And bring all your attention to the present moment. You can forget entirely about the past. And forget entirely about thoughts of the future. So just bringing all your attention to the most real experience we have, which is this direct sensation of body-mind in the present moment. So forgetting all about the concepts and ideas that we have Just coming fully into a direct experience of this body-mind right here and right now.
So bringing all your attention to the present moment, letting the mind be completely still, but not fixating on any particular object. So don't focus on any particular part of the body. Don't focus on any particular aspect of mind. Don't focus on any particular sensory domain. Yet don't let the mind wander. Keep the mind still, alert. yet not fixated on anything in particular. So disregarding all the specific sensations and thoughts that flow through experience, just holding the mind alert and still without reacting to anything that comes or goes not giving any extra attention to anything in particular. If you notice the mind getting a bit hazy or dull, then open your eyes halfway. just to help keep you fully present. And if you notice the mind fixating on any particular sensation or idea, just gently release your grip Release your grip on that thing. Cultivate disinterest towards that thing. We know it's there, but we have no interest in it. Cultivate the willingness to allow every aspect of body and mind to disappear. Don't try to make anything go away. Just be willing to let it vanish on its own if that's what happens. It's like watching a particular point in a river. The water keeps flowing past our field of view, but we don't follow the water with our eyes. We keep watching the same point in the river. In the same way, sensations of body and mind keep flowing through awareness, though we don't follow any particular sensation. We keep our gaze steady. We keep the awareness still.
fully alert, yet unmoving. Letting all things arise and cease without reaction. Whatever flows through the mind, don't make any concept about it. Don't give it a name. Don't give it a value. Don't call it good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant. Don't let it affect you at all. Just let it flow right through without sticking, without knocking the mind off balance in any way. Cultivating an alert disinterest, a mind that clearly knows everything flowing through it, but has no interest in any of that.
The moment you notice the mind latching onto an object, immediately release it, relinquish it. Let it fade away. Take no interest in it. Enjoying the peacefulness of a non-reactive mind, the blissfulness of a non-adhesive mind.
Keep the mind sharp and alert. Don't let it drift. Don't let it get hazy or dull. Keep it sharp and clear. Like a bright light that illuminates the fog.
So you can adjust your posture. Stretch a little bit. So at this time, um, Start by paying homage to the Buddhas and then give the Dhamma talk. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang namang sanghang namasami. So, in talking about Buddhist practice, well, it's good to remember that uh, this is what the Buddha called a, a gradual practice, gradual training, gradual progress. Uh, it's not normal for someone to suddenly um, make some dramatic breakthrough. That's not normally how things go. Uh, it's not usual that someone will go from being a um, completely terrible person to becoming a saint uh, in a single instant. It's not common for someone to go from uh, having a scattered, distracted, blurry, hazy, confused mind to awakening in a moment. And when those things do seem to happen, it's the result of past conditions coming together. You know, it's the result of uh, layer after layer of previous cultivation of good qualities uh, that are present in the subconscious mind. Uh, so then it's just the, the surface level of the mind that seems messy or chaotic or hazy. It's like the ocean. Um, when the surface of the ocean is um, storming and waves, if you just go a little bit below the surface, the ocean can seem quite calm, quite still. Uh, so for some people, that's what their mind is like. Uh, they've spent a lot of time um, in this life and in, in past lives, spent a lot of time cultivating good qualities of mind. Uh, cultivating wholesome qualities of, of kindness, compassion, mindfulness, concentration, serenity, equanimity. Uh, and uh, that creates a um, subsurface serenity of mind, a, a deep uh, peacefulness and joy of mind. This is often very clear in, in people from Buddhist cultures. Uh, there's this, this deep sense of serenity and stability and joyfulness of mind. Um, even in, in people who they don't necessarily meditate much, maybe actually haven't meditated much in their entire life, um, but they're still carrying with them uh, the power of, of all the practice they've done in previous lives. And in fact, to be born in a, in a Buddhist culture, to be raised in a Buddhist family, uh, to be exposed to Buddhism from uh, from one's infancy. Uh, this is all the result of having a strong karmic connection with Buddhism from past lives. Uh, so just to be born in a Buddhist culture is already an indication that somebody has some kind of affinity for Buddhism. It's already an indication that they have some kind of a basic foundation in the path. What they choose to do with it in this life is of course up to them. Uh, some people start with a strong foundation, but then they just spend their entire life tearing it down. And other people start with a weak foundation and they spend their whole life building it up. Um, so, of course, it's, it's good to 
recognize that there are differences in starting points. We don't all start from the same point. Um, just as if someone, if two people go to the gym and one of them has been going to the gym every day for the past 10 years and the other one just started yesterday. Well, of course, the person who's been going for 10 years is going to have a much easier time uh, doing the, the exercises in the gym. And the person who just started yesterday is going to have a much more difficult time. Uh, and you can say that's not fair. And in fact, if you're only looking at it from the perspective of one day, then yeah, it's true, it's not fair. Why is person B struggling so much more than person A? Clearly unfair. And that's true. But if you look at it over the perspective of those 10 years, then you see actually it's perfectly fair. Uh, person A has been diligently going to the gym for 10 years. Uh, person B has been sitting on their couch, binge watching Netflix and eating potato chips. So naturally, person B is going to have a much harder time uh, with the exercise programs. Naturally, it's not surprising at all. You know, it's perfectly fair. What would be unfair is if the person who had been practicing for 10 years was struggling just as much as the person who just started. So similarly, if someone's been practicing Buddhism for 10 lifetimes and somebody else just got started a few years ago, well, who do you think is going to have an easier time? It's not a difficult question. Uh, naturally, someone who's been practicing for many, many lifetimes is going to be having a much easier time because they've already cultivated all those qualities of mind. And there might be some surface level distraction or scatteredness in their mind. Uh, but with some practice, they can easily tap into that deep wellspring of serenity and clarity that they've built up over all those lifetimes. So uh, then when we face Buddhist practice, uh, often it seems like we're, we're climbing this impossibly tall mountain. Uh, so we're looking up at the distant heights of full awakening and we're still in the foothills and we're like, oh, wow, this is going to take a really, really long time. A lot of work. It's going to be very difficult. So much to do. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. That's exactly how it is. And start climbing. What else are you going to do? Give up? Uh, you can look and you can see the other people who are farther up the mountain than you. And it's like, oh, why are they farther up the mountain than me? Because they started at the bottom, just like you. And they started walking up that mountain and they kept going. They didn't stop. They kept going up that mountain, up and up and up and up and up, persistently striving for the top. And over the course of time, with sufficient wise effort, over the course of time, uh, you get farther and farther up the mountain. That's normal. That's natural. Uh, so mm, it's important not to get disheartened uh, when we reflect on how distant awakening is. But rather, the important thing is to ask ourselves, am I going in the right direction? Doesn't matter how far you have to go to the goal. What matters is, are you going in the right direction? Another big issue that, that comes up is this thought of like, well, what if I don't attain awakening in this life? And the answer is, well, I've got good news for you. Well, actually, it's bad news, but in this case, it's good news. Uh, the good news is you're going to get reborn. <coughs> And again, and again, and again, and again. So, yeah, maybe you don't make it all the way to the top of the mountain in this life. That's okay. Maybe you make it 1% of the way up. That's fine. Keep going. In your next life, you don't start over again at zero. You start at 1%, just where you left off. The question is, what do you do? Do you keep going up that mountain, maybe get to 2% before you die next time? Or do you turn around and go back down? Do you quit? Do you give up? What do you do? If you have even 1% uh, 
of progress, don't relinquish that 1% of progress. That's your most precious wealth. It's more important than all the money in your bank account. It's more important than all your friendships. It's more important than your career. It's more important than all your worldly information. It's more important than your writing project. It's more important than your house. The most important thing is that precious 1% of progress you've made towards awakening. That's more precious than anything else you have, anything else you possibly could have. That is your most pr uh, precious possession, your most valuable treasure. So that's what you want to carefully protect and hold on to. And to keep working on, on increasing that. 1.1%, 1.2%, 1.3%, keep building it up. Uh, so there's, there's an old saying, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Well, in the same, uh, similarly, nobody ever attained awakening in one day. And nobody ever attained awakening in one lifetime. Uh, traditionally, we say it took the Buddha three eons. So an eon is the a, a lifespan of a universe. Um, and actually this, this number is not to be taken seriously, by the way, it was actually a lot longer than that. Uh, but we say three eons for, well, it's traditional, um, but it's, it's not meant to be taken literally. Um, because actually the Buddha took an infinite number of eons just as the rest of us do, because there's no beginning to this round of rebirth. There's no beginning to this wandering through samsara. No matter how far back you look, you'll just find another life before that one. And another life before that one. And another life before that one. You can't find the first life. You can't find the starting point. <clears throat> so here we are wandering on and on, pointlessly going in the same circles over and over and over again. And eventually we come across Buddhism and we're like, oh, this is some pretty good stuff. And we practice and we get 1% up the slope towards awakening. And then we die and forget and walk right back down that hill again. And go right back to running around in circles on the plains, like everybody else. And eventually, after a few eons of torment, we find Buddhism again. And we're like, oh, hey, it's, it's this cool mountain. Maybe I'll try climbing up it. And this time we go up 2% maybe over the course of a couple lifetimes or so, we go 2% up the mountain. And then what do we do? We walk right, right back down again. We're like, oh yeah, this wasn't worth it. Too much effort. And we walk right back down that hill again. And repeat, 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 repeat. And something I like to reflect on every now and then uh, is how many times in this long cycle of samsara, how many times have I made it 99% to stream entry? 99% to the first stage of awakening. And backslid all the way to zero again. How many times have I been this close, this close to that irreversible breakthrough of wisdom? How many times have I been this close? and then backed off, didn't quite make it. How many times? The answer is too many, more than we can count. The good news is that it, we're capable of getting to 99%, it's pretty impressive. But it's very important to cultivate that spirit of persistence uh, because that's why we fell back from 99% all those times. It's because we lacked the quality of persistence. So you keep walking and walking and walking up that mountain and it's like, well, not there yet, not there yet, not there yet. I'll keep going. Don't stop. Keep going upward. And keep reminding yourself of how valuable every step up that mountain is. 
Keep reminding yourself of how important it is to keep moving upward, never to turn around, never to go back down that hill, but always keep moving upward and protect the progress that you make, to cherish the progress that you make. Because this is what keeps us going um, through life after life after life. Uh, so, uh, and again, it, it does, as I said, it, it takes many, many lifetimes for most people. And even the people who attain awakening in one lifetime, that's because they've already been practicing for many, many lives. Uh, the good news is that those of us who are here now practicing Buddhism, uh, we've probably already been at this for many lives, many lifetimes we've spent building up spiritual qualities, wholesome qualities, qualities of, of wisdom and serenity. We've already been working on this for life, uh, lifetimes. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be as far as we already are. So again, we're not starting from zero. Uh, we're already a little bit ways up that mountain, maybe farther than we think. One of the problems which sometimes happens in Buddhist circles is underestimation. Well, overestimation is also a big problem, um, but underestimation is, is commonly a problem. You get people who actually have some incredibly good qualities, uh, but they're convinced that they're terrible. They're convinced that they're, they're not good people. Uh, they're convinced that they're hopeless. Uh, and they neglect their own good qualities. They neglect their own cultivation of mind, their own cultivation of, of mindfulness, concentration, wisdom, kindness, morality, generosity. And they just fixate on their, their shortcomings. And yeah, well, guess what? Everyone who's not fully enlightened has shortcomings. That's kind of what it means to not be awakened. If you're not fully awakened, then you have shortcomings. Of course. So that means all of us are going to have shortcomings for quite a long time yet. So it's important to pay attention to our own good qualities and to really appreciate and value our good qualities uh, and to see them as something praiseworthy and something worth treasuring and something worth protecting and preserving, something worth developing and cultivating because that's what will give us the motivation to keep moving upward. And recognizing that we can make progress in the path, that we are capable of cultivating wholesome states of mind. Uh, because recognizing that we are capable of cultivating wholesome states of mind means that we're capable of continuing our upward progress, which means we are capable of getting all the way to the top. It's just a matter of pointing yourself in the right direction and keep going. That's all it is. So I don't really have too much else to say this evening. Uh, so just a few words of encouragement to spur you onwards, keep moving onwards and upwards, keep protecting the progress that you have, uh, focus on your good qualities, on your own capacity for spiritual self-development, uh, recognize that you can make progress when you try. Uh, recognize that this is more valuable and more important than anything else you can do with this life. And also that you don't need to get all the way in one life. As long as you make at least a little bit of upward progress, that's okay. As long as you have the, the dedication, the commitment, that you're going to keep moving upwards in future lives. Uh, you just keep yourself going in the right direction and you'll get there someday. So I think I'll go ahead and end my talk at this point uh, so we can end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. At this time, I can take any questions that you might have. Uh, so hello to everyone who's joining in. Hello to Rick, Janaki, Amaranta, John, Kumu, Gita, Patricia, Will, Yankee, Gary, John, Kayla, Jayanta, Pravat. Welcome, everyone. I don't see any questions online. Any questions here? No? 
Okay. So if there's no questions from online, then uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up the session. So sometimes it's important to learn more Dhamma, um, but sometimes it's important just to reflect on what we already know, on how much we already know of the path that we're not, that we're not fully practicing. Uh, so we might talk about morality, but how much do we actually practice it? How fully have we developed it? We talk about generosity, but are we actually practicing it to the best of our potential? Uh, we talk about mindfulness, but are we actually embodying it fully and completely? So uh, sometimes you don't necessarily need to learn new information about Dhamma. Uh, you just need to practice what you already know. So I do see a few questions. Uh, Proto Dhamma is asking, how do I let go of relationship loss? Uh, that's actually a great question for monk chat tomorrow evening. Uh, so that's not quite related to the topic here. So let's save that for tomorrow monk chat at this time. Patricia asks, could you please share some more on how to protect our progress? Well, first off, as I said, to recognize that recognize the progress you've made and to really value and treasure it. Uh, this is very important. Recognize how important and, and valuable you, the progress you have already is. Whatever practices you've been doing, uh, don't stop them. Whatever you've been doing that's been working, keep doing that. And whenever you notice yourself tempted to backslide, remind yourself of the dangers of backsliding. Uh, so, for example, maybe you've had a resolution of not watching movies and you've been really good about not watching movies for a few months. And then you see this of like, eh, maybe I'll just uh, take a few hours and catch up on some of the things that my friends have seen. And, and, you're, and you're like, no, 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 wait, wait, I'm actually doing pretty good here. Uh, I don't want to go back on the progress I've made. That would be kind of disappointing. So watch out for the, the mind of, of backsliding, which tries to justify backsliding. Uh, because this is, this is quite dangerous. Uh, once we start slipping back in our old habits, our old ways, uh, then you can start losing a lot of progress very quickly. So yeah, focus on the happiness and joy that comes from uh, your spiritual practice. That also helps to motivate things. And Jaskar asks, uh, I used to meditate a lot, but now I can't meditate as long as before. Any advice for that? Yeah, stop believing that you can't meditate for as long as before. That's just a story that you're telling yourself. It's not true. Uh, you could sit down and meditate for six hours straight right now if you wanted to. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past or what you've done recently or long ago. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you decide to do now. So if you used to meditate for an hour, and now you're only doing half an hour. Well, I challenge you, as soon as this talk is over, sit down, set a timer for an hour, and don't get up till that timer goes off. You know you can do it. You've done it before. So just resolve to do it again. It's not that you can't sit as long as you're used to. It's that you don't sit as long as you're used to. So it's the quality of determination, quality of resolution. Bring it up. Bring up that determination. Make that resolution. I'm going to sit down and I'm not going to get up until this timer goes off. And do it, follow through. You know you can do it because you've done it before. And don't make excuses, just do it. Rick says, I've heard that we should celebrate the good qualities in ourselves and others. Yeah, that's true. The Buddha spoke about that quite a bit. In addition, we grow best by focusing on our strengths, using them to make progress on our less developed areas. Do you any, have any reflections on these perspectives? Yeah, they sound quite correct to me. I think that's all, that's quite useful. Uh, especially focusing on the positive can be very powerfully motivating. Uh, often if we just focus on our shortcomings and drawbacks all the time, that can actually be quite depressing and disheartening. And that's when you just wanna go curl up with a tub of ice cream in your Netflix subscription. I've never actually done this in my entire life, by the way, but I hear it's popular. 
Um, so instead, you start reflecting on your own good qualities. You start thinking about all the times you've been generous and kind. Start thinking about all the meditation you've done. You start thinking about how you've developed so much in mindfulness and serenity and equanimity, uh, how much wisdom you've cultivated. Uh, and you're like, oh, wow. Wow. That's impressive. I'm impressive. Wow. I'm impressive because I have these impressive qualities of heart. And I can develop them even further. And then I'll be even more impressive. That's great. I'm going to do that. So to some extent, you can actually use the mind's own egotism to support your practice. I am like the best monk ever. And I'm going to be even better than the best monk ever. Well, great. Yeah, go for it. Use that egotism to your advantage. Because eventually, that will lead to the relinquishment of ego. So if your determination is to be the best Buddhist in the world, well, congratulations, that's a great determination. Keep it up. So that's the last of the questions. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and end at this time. Uh, so you have, if you have any extra questions, please bring them to Monk Chat tomorrow evening and I'll answer whatever questions you might have then. So we'll end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>